Good morning, friends, and welcome welcome to another uh, uns well a uh, scheduled video. We are actually covering Paul Ferguson's sentencing hearing live. You're getting a look at him at the defendant's desk with his attorney. He's signing paperwork. Um, there is no audio in this feed right now. I'm going to actually turn it up. But this is uh, Paul Ferguson uh, sitting at that very same table his mother sat at, Shonda Vanderock. As you recall, Ed, we saw her sentenced with the snow coming down, a very different picture outside mm -hmm. today, no snow. Um, thoughts on what we're going to see here, Ed? Well, um, it's going to be a very deliberate and thoughtful sentencing, given all the facts the judge uh, had to review um, from the defense attorney, from the psych report, uh, the state's report, uh, and possibly even the video you sent them, Ron. Right. Uh, where I'm, yeah, you know, Ed, I'm glad you mentioned that. I uh, completely forgot about it because I'm running around like a chicken with my head cut off. Um, but yeah, there's so much that's involved in this sentencing with, as it pertains to his mental health capacity, right? Um, many conversations going on around the internet about Asperger's and, and different kinds of, um, we don't know what they, uh, what type of batteries of testing that they did with him, but we heard some of his jail phone calls and he was talking about getting 25 minutes with the psychologist in prison, in jail. Um, you know, we heard Anthony Ganji in the past that talk about that they have sufficient services for mental health uh, in facilities. But you and I both know well from being in and out of these jails and prisons, it's less than ideal. But when you look at what Paul Ferguson has alleged to have done to, well, he's now you know guilty of child abuse in the first degree. I personally look at it through my own lens, and I say he tag teamed along with his, his mother, Timothy, Timothy Ferguson, in the starvation mode and also in torture methods. A hot sauce, the video I sent to the judge, the, um, the wall sits, the chasing, the ice baths, the handcuffs, the zip ties. I mean, the laundry list goes long. It's long and, 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 and horrific to listen to. But there's so much more that they they probably have done to him that we never even heard about. Uh, and, and, and who knows if he enjoyed what he was doing. But I know for a fact that he was doing it for six months, Ed. It was nonstop. Yeah, yeah. And here's another thing. I'm. Uh, I, I let's see if the apple falls far from the tree here. If he objects to uh, anything that was in the uh, report, I, there. <laughs> I like doubt the, it. <laughs> like the mother did. I watched that last night. It's funny you just put, brought that up, Ed. I watched <laughs> that last night on the replay before I went to bed, and it was disgusting. The amount of pages she made her defense attorney go through to correct little minor details on the reports, misspelled words. Um, you know, just it was <laughs> well. It was, just, it was all her controlling issues um, that kept, that was evident what she was doing there. You know, her last bit of control uh, before she went to the big house was mm -hmm. you know to get and then the narcissism, of course. You know, I, you know, I have this degree, I have that degree. No, this is not correct. This you know, I want right. this corrected. Right, right. You, let, let's go to the chat and say hello to everybody. What's your thoughts? We have an open poll right now. Um, what do you think would be an appropriate sentence for Paul Ferguson? He stands, uh, he pled guilty. He stands before the court today on child abuse in the first degree, uh, which is punishable up to life in prison or any other determined sentence of years. And it says years in the uh, sentencing guidelines. So it's plural. So this means two or more years uh, he could be sentenced and up to it. That's a very broad range, Ed. Um, when I read that, I had to read it twice. Uh, but at the end of the day, he tag teamed with his mother, Timothy Ferguson, a 15 year old autistic boy with you know limited motor skills. He can, could, com could communicate, but um, as we heard them testify it was limited in his communications. At times they said he could communicate, but I don't know if they were lying or not. So we don't know enough about Timothy Ferguson, but we do know that he was tortured 
tremendously. And the papers that you're hearing shuffling is inside the courtroom. So maybe I'm going to just mute that. Um, but yeah, so what's your thoughts? Make sure you go to the poll. Make sure you share this video out. And I'm going to put you, um, I'm going to take myself off because I got to do a little bit of uh, maintenance in the background here. I got to do some sharing. Uh, but just continue that conversation with the with the live chatters and see what they have to say. What's their thoughts on what could be a possible just sentence for Timothy, uh, for Paul Ferguson, for the pain and suffering and the murder, ultimately, of Timothy Ferguson? He doesn't stand charged with murder, but just get their thoughts. Okay, dope. So Ron disappears and left me in charge. <laughs> Anyhow, I see a lot of people here are conflicted. Um, there's many of many people here who are, are you know don't know which way uh, to to go with this um, because of uh, mitigating factors in uh, Paul's uh, growing up in this environment and whether he is uh, fully capable of understanding uh, everything that he's done to him or was he brainwashed by his mother. Um, but there are some disturbing things that uh, came to light from his uh, previous um, when he uh, previously when he was living in Oklahoma uh, that I found quite disturbing. But the judge can't use that here because it was never entered. Oh, they're rising. Um, so the judge is stepping in, Ron. Matthew R. Casel is presiding. Can everybody hear it? And you may be seated. I'm here with you, Ed. I'm back. Here we go, folks. Before the court is filed, 223537FC, it's people of the state of Michigan versus Paul Ferguson. Are you Paul Ferguson, sir? Yes, sir. Answer verbally. Yes, Are sir. Paul Ferguson? Yes. All right. Mr. Ferguson appears before the court with his attorney, Mr. Joshua L. Brady. The people are represented by Mr. Nasser Roberts. Same time is scheduled for a sentencing in this case. Have the people had a chance to read the pre sentence report and the transcript? We have, Your Honor. We have no corrections to that, although I know. I did receive a letter from uh, Nolan Ferguson, who was here with me present for Shonda Bangers. So he's got a letter from the brother. I did receive that this morning. I did have a chance to read that. I have a copy, yes, Sean, and I have no objection to that either. Okay. Uh, also, the court is in receipt of two assessments, psychological assessments. Uh, one is from Thomas D. Shaver, psychiatrist, forensic psychologist uh, in Ann Arbor. What's going the, on here? Uh, the background noise. The audio is low in the courtroom, folks. No, it's repeating. All rise, this just repeated itself. Ron, we're getting rep has reviewed those in anticipation of sentencing, uh, Mr. Roberts. What are you getting then? We're getting a repeat of what was already said. Okay, because you might be sharing it, so maybe t shut yours off. I, I'm I'm not I'm not sharing it. Remember you were remember you were set up with it, Ed. No objection, but I would ask those be considered as non-public. Yeah, the court is going to have them scanned into the court file, but they are going to be non-public. All right, I'm going to stop sharing. Not me. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing and then reshare Chrome tab. Is going to reference certain conclusory uh, conclusions from these Are we good? Reports, yeah. But those do not reveal specific. Let us know in the chat if you could hear it. The audio is low. So the That's the court feed. Make these part of the record because it's going to be in custody of those sentencing. Again, it's going to be non-public. So, all right. Um, any additions or corrections you have to the pre-sentence report, Mr. Roberts? Uh, beyond that, additional. Okay, Mr. Uh, Brady, have you had an opportunity to review the pre-sentence report? Which guidelines? 
Yes, I have no additions or corrections. I would also note as we're on the topic of letters, I submitted a letter from Stephen and Martha Vander Ark. Those are Mr. Ferguson's. I believe those would be step grandparents. Um, I knew we would hear from the grandparents. Of, I knew the step grandma from the phone call. She would write a letter. Support this morning, but we're ill this weekend. Yeah, I have also considered that too. Did you receive a copy of that as well, Mr. Brown? I did. Okay, I read that too. Uh, I've gotten. A, a large number of letters from people that I would say unrelated to this case specifically, um, just individuals who saw it on court TV and, and um, expressing an opinion. I, I am not considering those in sentencing. Um, because one, they're not directly connected to the case. Uh, I, and I do appreciate the comments from individuals, uh, but I, I think it's important we limit the record to the people that actually have something to do with this case or connected with the victim. So, unless there's an objection to that, I, I've read them, but I'm not using it as a consideration. So, any objection to that, Mr. Robbins? Mr. Elvin Brady? I would note, not having seen copies of those, I can't comment on a specific letter, but no issue with that. Yeah, I mean, there, there was, there's just random people who saw it on TV, and I think that would be appropriate for the court to, to take that into consideration for sentencing purposes. I don't think that's very useful for purposes. Uh, so no additions or corrections, Mr. Elfrey? No additions or corrections. All right. And uh, Mr. Ferguson, have you received a copy of the pre-sentence report that was read to Ag Miles? Yes, Your Honor. Any additions or corrections you have? No, Your Honor. And you have an okay. opportunity to discuss the contents of that report with your attorney? Yes, Your Honor. All right. Uh, Mr. Roberts, do we have any victim representative who wishes to make a statement today? We do not, Your Honor. Okay. Any comments regarding sentencing? Yes, Your Honor, thank you. Um, as I've said to the court before, uh, this is, as it relates to Paul, this is one of the most difficult cases I think I've ever had to deal with, uh, not just from the standpoint of how difficult the subject matter was to the tragic Timothy and the circumstances surrounding it, but just with Paul himself, and, and I'm not saying anything today, but really just I have told uh, uh, multiple meetings that we had in leading up to the trial and his cooperation there that there, that I view him as uh, favorable in that he was willing to help us and to testify against his mother, which I'm sure was very difficult for him to do under the circumstances. Uh, but that I was also angered, just frankly angered and, and, and shocked and appalled at, at his treatment of Timothy because he was, for all intents and purposes, the, the enforcer arm of this two person, uh, or the two people most directly responsible for Timothy's death. That he was the one that could deal out most of the punishment. Again, the audio is low, not on our behalf. It's the court feed, and I don't see it anywhere else. So this is what we we got. So just listen with headphones. I hear it good. About Paul, um, even up to and including the time that he testified in this trial, and those frankly continue. Uh, and one of the things that, that we discussed at the time of the plea was giving Mr. Elvin Brady an opportunity to get the evaluation that we now have in an effort to hopefully demonstrate in some regard why Paul did these things. Uh, was, it, was it a psychological condition? Was there some manipulation taking place? Um, and quite frankly, I think just as my feeling is, is, is good and bad with Paul, I think both of these assessments reflect the same thing. Um, what is absolutely clear from both of these assessments is that whatever upbringing Paul had um, from his... I could tell you this. We're going to hear the judge loud and clear. ...led to him being how he is today. That, that was a childhood that I think both reports indicate was marked with abuse and neglect, uh, a traumatic upbringing, uh, moved around a lot. And, and what also rings through in this, these assessments is that nobody did anything to get Paul any help uh, when, when it could have made a difference. Uh, so so that, is, that is, in some respects, that's the good part of this because it does seem to at least explain in some regard why Paul behaved the way that he did. Uh, but there's bad in here as well. The court will note this, but the, the, the one sentence that struck me in Dr. Shazer's report uh, is that it says, In my opinion, Paul Ferguson was predisposed they just to fixed his it. brother independent of his mother's presence and active influence in his life. Um, that's frankly scary. Uh, and there are other scary parts of this as well that, that indicate that Paul was, at least in some respect, predisposed to being essentially a bully. Um, and, and that's 
that that's how you could view his behavior is that, that he was a bully. Now, nobody, I think, would expect any bully to take it to the extreme of actually killing a person, uh, although certainly it does happen, but, but nobody would expect that that was an intentional outcome that Paul sought here. Um, and we can't lose sight of the fact that Paul didn't become this way in a vacuum, that, that his upbringing in some respects led to him being predisposed, as this report indicates, and I think the other report references it as well, that he was predisposed to already doing some of these things. Um, frankly, I think that Ms. Van der Ark took advantage of that and used Paul because she saw an opportunity to have Paul do the, the horrible things that she couldn't do herself or wouldn't do herself, but be done at her direction. Uh, and Paul was unfortunately willing to go along with those things because of, again, because of everything that had happened to him, because of his traumatic upbringing and because of the conditions that he did have uh, that, that led to that. So it, it's hard to balance these things out. Um, certainly, we did not have this report at the time that Paul pled. Um, and I, I don't know that in looking at this report, the, the decision that was made in this case would be any different. Um, but certainly there are things here that would have been nice to have been able to consider, but we didn't have the benefit of that. And as, as I told the court, I think I've told the court on several occasions in speaking to the jury, they were, uh, in, in Ms. Van der case, very much um, impressed by, might not be the right word, but, but certainly factored in Paul's testimony a great deal, uh, believed that he was telling the truth, believed that he was honest about what his role in this and, and Ms. Van der Ark's role in this. So I think his testimony was instrumental in, in achieving the conviction that was that was uh, achieved here against Ms. Van der Ark. So we, I certainly owe Paul that consideration. And But beyond that, I, I, I certainly don't envy the position the court is in today. Um, I, in balancing everything that has taken place here, the, the good and the bad, uh, even in this report, and the good and the bad with Paul, I will stick to the agreement that we have made here. I will ask the court to sentence within the sentencing guidelines in this case. Certainly the court has, look, the court is, is obviously free to exceed the guidelines if it feels there's a basis to do so. And quite frankly, there are reasons to exceed the guidelines. In some respects, there's reasons to go below the guidelines as well. So literally, I think any number that the court chooses to pick here, I think could, would be the appropriate sentence because I think it's, it's a difficult balancing act that the court has to do here. Um, but my commitment was and continues to be that we would ask the court to sentence within the sentencing guidelines. I would ask the court, however, to impose a, a maximum number here that is essentially equivalent to what Paul's life expectancy would be. The I'm with, the, that that I'm with this the guy. Bad that's indicated in these reports is actually present and, and Paul does not receive treatment for that. And, and those conditions that, that are noted here, most notably the potential antisocial disorder, the, the, essentially a sociopath, if those things are borne out in, in the prison system, that the prison system then has the opportunity to keep Paul locked up as, as long as possible. Uh, I, I hope that he can get some treatment inside there, but the bad in here has got to be addressed, and if it's not, then certainly Paul does represent a threat to the public moving forward, because of his disassociation, essentially, from feeling empathy or feeling bad about the things that he had done. In the moment, it did not appear that Paul felt bad about those things. There certainly was a moment where he, he thought he needed to let his mother know that Timothy was very thin and that they should start feeding him. But overall, what comes through in this, these reports is that for the most part, those were absent. And the text messages, I think, even bear that out as well. But even after that noting of, of the fact that Timothy was very thin and that they needed to start feeding him, Paul was still a willing participant in the in the truly tragic and horrible things that happened in the last days of Timothy's life, including the prolonged ice bath that Paul washed over. Um, so, so certainly that, that bad needs to be addressed as well. Um, so again, I, I, I don't envy the position the court is in today. I will stick with my commitment here and ask the court to sentence within the sentencing guidelines. But quite frankly, any number that the court picks here, I think would be an appropriate sentence uh, for Mr. Ferguson. Um, I'm pleased that we've been able to achieve, to achieve whatever justice we could for Timothy here in both of these convictions, and, and certainly the two people most directly responsible for what happened to Timothy are, are going to, in all likelihood, be incarcerated for an extended period of time, certainly in Ms. Van der Ark's case for the rest of her life, which is completely justified under these circumstances. So I would ask the court to, as it, as it will have to do, to weigh the good and the bad here in these reports, uh, and, and I trust the court's I trust whatever decision the court makes here.
Your Honor, I'd like to start by responding to a point that Mr. Robert made before I go into um, the multiple points I plan to address. I, I understand the prosecutor's characterization of Paul as being the enforcer, as being the primary one. But I believe part of that is based simply on the evidence that we have. This court's heard the text messages, extensive text messages of Ms. Van Der Ark instructing Paul on what he was to do to Timothy. We've heard Paul's, we've heard Paul's testimony about what he was instructed to do and what he did. The rest of the time, when she was there doing whatever she did, Paul was at work. She didn't have to send text messages to her son. Timothy's not here to talk about what happened when it was just him and his mother. So I, I disagree with that characterization. I, I believe, based on what we do know of Ms. Van Der Ark, that there was far, far more that went on. There was far, far more that she did that there simply is no evidence of, no one to speak of, because the only person alive who knows what she did is her. Beyond that, reading the pre-sentence report in this case, I can't argue with the reasonableness of the recommendations in the pre-sentence report. I also really can't add anything about the offense, about the details of what happened to Timothy. You presided over the same trial that I watched. I know in motions other paperwork submitted to the court, you're aware of far, far more than what came out publicly, what was submitted to the jury. But I'd ask the court to consider, I, I think there's five fronts on which Paul should be evaluated very differently than where his mother is. And the first is just capacity to understand. We heard Ms. Van Der Ark's attorney argue they didn't know what they were doing. They didn't realize that it could kill him or cause that level of injury. And I don't have to come to a conclusion. I don't have to say I think that's right or that's wrong to understand that a 41-year-old law school graduate who was, by her own boasting, at the top of her class, has passed the bar with flying colors, who would have been an attorney, well, academically was qualified to be an attorney. We never got an answer of why she wasn't. And who worked for the court, both from a legal front, from a moral front, from an intellectual front, had far, far more capacity to understand what she was doing and the potential consequences of what she was doing than her son, who was a 20-year-old high school graduate who worked as a dishwasher. There's simply no comparison in capacity, in life experience, in an ability to understand and recognize what was happening. Second, well, we recognize for purposes of the child abuse statute, for purposes of Paul's plea, the law may not distinguish between a parent and another person over the age of 18 who's placed in charge of a child. We all know a mother has a very different role than a sibling. We all know that there's a certain level of rivalry, a certain level of competition that we expect between siblings, which is very different than the care that we expect from parents. Third, and I'll come back to the text messages, it was very clear Paul was the follower and his mother was the leader in this case. Listening to over an hour of text messages read during her trial, there's pieces missing. We don't get the whole story because she talked to him over the camera, or she talked to him on the phone, or she talked to him in person. But what is very clear from those text messages is there is not a single time that Paul gives an instruction. Every single time an instruction is given, you need to do this, it is given by her. 
force, and Mr. Roberts has addressed this regarding Paul's cooperation. Once the gravity of what happened sank in, I believe from the reports that was a day or so after, Paul has shown remorse. He's shown confusion over how he could have done this and recognition that it was wrong. He's testified honestly. He's fully cooperated in many areas in ways that were not of clear benefit to him. His mother did none of these things. She took the stand and lied, redirected. It's not my fault. I didn't do anything wrong. And fifth, and I think very important in looking at the evaluation of Mr. Ferguson. It's very clear that he and his other siblings were also victims of their mother. CPS involvement, going back to when they were in elementary school, back when Timothy was 18 months old. A third grade teacher who said, Paul and Nolan are secretive about what happens at home. They're not supposed to talk about it. So when Mr. Johnson argued, in cross-examination to Paul, why didn't you report it to somebody? A lifetime of being told you're not supposed to talk about what goes on at home. A lifetime of being isolated, separated from peers, having no meaningful social contacts outside his household. That all started with her. A record that when Timothy was 18 months old, when Paul was seven, that Timothy was underfed, failure to thrive. Paul didn't have anything to do with that. He was seven. But that was the pattern. That was his entire life. That was his entire framework. That was what she taught him from the beginning, or at times failed to teach him through neglect. Mr. Roberts referenced, and I don't remember if it was in sentencing or in his closing argument, that the difference between Timothy and Paul was that Paul was useful. Timothy wasn't. At least not to their mother. And I wouldn't disagree with that characterization. But I think that's important for the court to consider. Timothy was treated the way he was because he wasn't useful. That's how children in their mother's household were treated if they weren't useful. And I believe at some level, some part of Paul understood that. He understood that we do these things to Timothy because he misbehaves, because he doesn't follow instruction, and because he's not useful. And part of understanding that is also understanding that if he didn't follow instruction, if he misbehaved, if he got on her bad side, that he could once again be subject to some of the same mistreatment. On the neglect front, I don't think any of them ever ceased to be subject to that mistreatment. And I'll end with his mother's own words from the text messages read before. To Paul, quote, if he falls asleep for you, from you, not watching, that is not going to end well for either of you. What about Paul's text message that he's going to beat him to almost to death? not in response to anything Mr. Eisenberg just said, but the court referenced that it's had a lot of outside people contacting the court. I certainly have had that as well. Um, and one of, the, one of the consistent themes there is people believing that Paul suffers, or not suffers, I shouldn't, it's, it's not a suffering. But Paul is on the autism spectrum. Um, I think it's important to note that in both of these evaluations, that's not borne out. Um, 
certainly people may have that, have that belief and, and think that that should be a factor here, but there's nothing in either one of these reports that supports that conclusion. So I, I just want to note that. Um, that is certainly something that I think the court could have considered, uh, but there's nothing in the report that would support that. And I don't think Mr. Ellen Brady would disagree with that point. Yeah. I, I was in the room at that time as well. So. Your Honor, I, I think the reports do bear out that some of the characteristics that those individuals are observing and coming to that conclusion are connected to that neglect and abuse and I believe it was Dr. Farrakh characterized as normalization of abnormal behavior. Um, so while I agree that, that both analysis seem to have come to the conclusion that that diagnosis is inappropriate, um, I don't believe that those observations by the individuals mentioning that are ungrounded. It's simply that, that those behavioral characteristics come from a different source and therefore do not lead to the ability to officially diagnose with that condition. That does not change the fact that those characteristics are there, that those characteristics are relevant to Paul's interactions with his mother, or that those characteristics are relevant to um, ongoing treatment services that Paul will need moving. Mr. Ferguson, anything wish to say prior to sentencing? Uh, yeah, yes, new owner. <clears throat> what reasons could justify my actions? I could make up a thousand and never believe one. What words could voice my regrets? I can think of millions, yet never regret one. If I could do it all again and do it right, I would. I feel I will pay for my choices and yet never feel better because he's still gone. I have had time to think during my time in Muskegon County Jail, and I've realized many things about myself that I might never have, other, have considered otherwise. My problems and flaws, to put it simply, are the place to begin correction of self. I asked the judge for nothing more and mercy and fairness to offer me compassion so I might learn from him. I only hope to better myself in the coming days and serve my time with what little honor I have left and to make right my faults in search of a better tomorrow. Uh, first and uh, foremost, uh, Mr. Roberts referenced uh, being Court is in a, in a very was in a difficult position. Uh, this particular case, I think a lot of individuals saw Mr. Ferguson testify, and I think there was concerns about intellectual uh, potential disabilities, and the court was concerned with that as well. Uh, there was also a concern uh, whether Mr. Ferguson was the uh, was the target of manipulation on behalf of his mother. Uh, and the reports that were submitted to the court really did help me a lot uh, in trying to parse those issues out. Uh, the report specifically by Dr. Shazer was very in-depth um, and very well done. And I, and I thank him for, for doing such a detailed analysis. So the, the first concern of the court was whether or not Mr. Ferguson was suffering from some sort of intellectual disability, whether it be autism or something else. And uh, there's a couple of references to that throughout his, uh, Mr. Sh excuse me, Dr. Shaver's report. And um, specifically, the first reference that the court had highlighted was uh, page uh, two of the report, the first full paragraph. And it says, uh, in my opinion, he, referring to Mr. Ferguson, was clearly either psychotic or suffering from symptoms of a mood disorder at the time of the interview. And he was apparently functioning within at least the normal range of intellectual ability at this time. Thus, in my opinion, he does not suffer from a chronic psychotic disorder, a chronic mood disorder, or an intellectual disability. There is another reference more to the end of the report. 
uh, where he indicates uh, thus his his referring to Mr. Ferguson, his educational history is inconsistent with him suffering from intellectual deficits, and as noted above, he was apparently functioning within at least the normal range of intellectual ability at the time of the court interview. In my opinion, the defendant clearly does not suffer from an intellectual disability. So the court, uh, that was helpful in the court because as, as in, in some of the letters that I received as well, Mr. Roberts indicated that there was concern that Mr. Ferguson was autistic. Uh, and I think probably more toward that was easier to maybe manipulate him and that kind of thing. And certainly the court does take someone's intellectual capacity into consideration. I think it's important to understand the full situation. So the court, uh, and that, and, and although those are two small portions of the opinion that the court referenced, uh, they're borne out by much more in detail history uh, in Dr. Shazer's report. Uh, specifically, Dr. Shazer uh, analyzed every statement that the defendant gave the police. He also watched the testimony of Mr. Ferguson, uh, interviewed him himself. He also looked through uh, his history uh, from the Oklahoma Department of Health and Human Services, looked through his history uh, from school records, from various psychological assessments that were conducted throughout his life uh, based on the report. So I think that opinion is well grounded uh, in not only his interview, his review of educational records, his review of his mental health records, and um, and everything else, Health West records currently from when he was uh, assessed when he became in the Muskegee County Jail. So the court uh, finds that to be quite persuasive in terms of whether or not Mr. Ferguson is suffering from any intellectual disability. And the court can, concludes based on, on this report, uh, well written report, well grounded in, in uh, fact and history of the defendant, that he was not suffering from an intellectual disability currently or at the time of this offense. Uh, the second thing is whether or not Mr. Ferguson was somehow manipulated or coerced by his mother. Uh, I think all of us would like to believe that this is a product of manipulation, that this is simply somebody doing something that they were told to do, that they were afraid. Uh, Mr. Alvin Brady mentioned it in his allocution regarding the specific text message as well. Those specific text messages I heard as well at the trial. Uh, shortly after the trial concluded, I had asked the prosecutor's office for a complete copy of every single text message that had occurred between Ms. Vander and Mr. Ferguson because I didn't want just the snippets, the kind of highlights or the you know the, the real you know, juicy stuff, for lack of a better term. I wanted to understand completely what the conversation was between these individuals. I read every single text message, every one of them. I think there's thousands in there, and I've read it three times now, three times in total. I read it you know, two months ago, I read it a month ago, and I read it last week, Friday. The entire afternoon was spent reading through these things. And I think it's clear to me that Mr. Ferguson, although he says that he was scared of his mother, or there's an allegation of that standpoint, I find that just the opposite to be true based on those text messages. Uh, there is some mention about punishment, but I think Mr. Ferguson, uh, in my opinion, uh, being submissive, for lack of a better term, to his mother was a result that he really had nowhere else to go. Uh, he had been kicked out from his father's house for, for failing to obey his father's rule and for other things. And he went to his mother's house, and I don't think Mr. Ferguson really had anywhere else to go. I think he was sort of uh, beholden to his mother uh, in terms of, well, there's going to be consequences. Although there are some text messages, one or two of those that bear that out, uh, this strikes me in the text messages as more of a collaborative effort. In fact, there's some text messages where Ms. Van der Ark actually tells Mr. Ferguson uh, that if Ms. Timothy does not behave, essentially, I'm going to leave him to you as in that he's gonna let the dog out and just bob off the chain. And uh, Mr. Ferguson also several times um, essentially tells his mother, 
things that are going on that are bad. Uh, and I think it's because he wants his, his mother to give him the permission to go ahead and engage in punishment. So in terms of uh, whether or not his mother, he was somehow afraid of his mother, uh, I don't think that'd be the case. Now, that was my initial feeling about it, my, and what I, what I took it as, and that's why I wanted the assessment regarding whether or not he was being manipulated. And luckily, we, uh, we did get one from, uh, uh, the second one I referenced was from Dr. Farhat, which is uh, specific. I think he was, he was asked to assess this particular question. And in the beginning of his assessment, is, he says that specifically, I was asked to assess whether Mr. Ferguson possessed a psycholo psychological disorder of traits that would render him significantly susceptible to manipulation, coercion, or suggestibility. After conducting the evaluation, I could not substantiate these traits as they pertain to the commission of the offense. As such, this report will instead explain the nature of the evaluation and my overall opinion regarding Mr. Ferguson's psychological functioning. Uh, he also opined uh, regarding his uh, intellectual uh, abilities. He says, from a diagnostic standpoint, I did not find sufficient evidence to support Mr. Ferguson meeting criteria for any specific mental disorder. But one may consider whether his presentation suggested a neurodevelopmental condition, for example, e.g. autism spectrum disorder. I did not find this to be an appropriate label. Instead, I attributed his overall demeanor and presentation to factors such as a lack of socialization, normalization of abnormal dynamics and experiences, poor interpersonal skills, and emotional dysregulation. We also indicate later on on that page that I was initially asked to evaluate whether Mr. Ferguson had a mental condition or traits that would have rendered him susceptible to coercion, manipulation, or suggestibility at the time of the offense. Ultimately, I could not arrive at this conclusion based on the totality of available information. Available evidence noted, noted that he was capable appreciating the abuse towards his brother, that he was capable of recognizing the detrimental impact it had, and that he at times disobeyed this dandelion and tried to provide his brother with aid and support. Furthermore, despite reporting that he was under Ms. Vanderark's quote, psychological hold, he adamantly denied that he was coerced or manipulated into enforcing the abuse. Additionally, he recognized to some degree pleasure and having power and control over his younger brother. In this sense, while I acknowledge that he reported experiencing fear and concerns of disobeying this man or art, I could not reliably substantiate his involvement as being a byproduct of suggestibility, uh, suggestibility or co coercion. So what this court is left to conclude is that Mr. Ferguson, The way I look at this is that Mr. Ferguson and these reports, and a lot of these, there's, throughout the report, there's, there's talk about how Mr. Ferguson bullied his brother uh, when he was younger. Uh, that uh, there's a mention, his, his stepsister, who I think was uh, allocated on behalf of his mother, uh, or, 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 or on behalf of Paul, uh, excuse me, Timothy, at his, uh, at Ms. Vanderark's sentencing. This is, says the stepsister, and this is before the police even really gave, told her about exactly what had happened in here. says the stepsister reportedly told the police that, quote, she doesn't know how involved Paul was in this situation, that he is the biggest bully she has ever met in her life, and he found genuine joy in tormenting Timothy whenever possible. Just for clarification, I don't think that was Millie. That the okay, steps so maybe I'm wrong. Millie. Okay, so perhaps I'm wrong about that. But this was someone who, without even knowing the full details, uh, reported that. Uh, in one of the interviews, uh, Mr. Ferguson indicated that he liked getting praised by Shonda and admitted he liked having control over Timothy. He reportedly admitted having power over somebody feels good. Later in the, in the interview, I asked him whether he had felt ashamed at the time when he was abusing his brother, and he said, quote, no, he had not. 
I asked whether he had recognized his action as morally wrong at the time, and he again said, quote, no, he had not. He then volunteered that on one occasion, quote, I sent her a photo of how thin he was, and, and, why, and when I asked why he did this, he explained that I was worried. When asked when he was worried about Mr. Ferguson, uh, Ferguson replied that he had been concerned for his house, that he was nothing but bones. I asked him whether he had, at the moment, thought that this abusive behavior was wrong, and he replied that, quote, that thought never even crossed my mind. treatment plan back from July 22nd of 2012 indicates that, quote, client, meaning Mr. Ferguson, sometimes bullies his younger brother, the decedent, Timothy. The report also uh, mentions cruelty to animals, stealing, abuse. His mother at the time back in 2018 told staff at the clinic he's become bossy, telling his siblings what to do. Well, Mr. Ferguson's part reportedly when commenting about his being irritable, he admits that this is due to his younger siblings not listening. He gets physically aggressive towards his younger siblings. Uh, also, he also tried to lock his younger brother, i.e. apparently a reference to the decedent in the closet because his brother wouldn't listen to him. So the, the court read this and certainly looks at this as someone who is predisposed, I think was often the conclusion, predisposed to abuse his brother, specifically the victim in this case, in a history of doing that. Now, I have no doubt in my mind that Mr. Ferguson was a result of years and years and years of physical neglect and abuse on behalf of his mother. No doubt in my mind that's borne out in this but the court is asked to essentially ignore the, the decisions or his behavior because of that, and to somehow say that we're gonna minimize the damage and what he did in this case because of that. If the court started imposing that standard, I think we'll be in real trouble because every defendant that comes before this court has a horrible history, I would say. That's the reason they're here. People that have supportive parents and, and things go good for them typically don't come here. Now, that's not always the case. Believe me, there's a lot of interventions. But everybody has a history. And what I was looking at is whether or not this is a product of his mother or his situation. And what I can conclude is that this is not. Mr. Ferguson is trying to shift blame from his mother, from him to his mother say that somehow, well, if it wasn't for her, I wouldn't have done this, or she's the one that did this. At the trial, well, I heard this, I her order, at her order, at her order, you kept saying it over and over and over again. I said, just keep underscoring the point. And if that had been an isolated incident, if that had been one or two of these things, if that had been a punishment that he administered, maybe the court could accept that. So we have an individual who is in a household for six months, intentionally himself engaging in torture of another person. And he doesn't, he said, well, I'm worried about what my mom's going to say. Clearly, that doesn't, it's not borne out in those reports. He had the ability to disobey his mom. In fact, he was on the stand and almost boasted that I gave him extra food. Weren't you worried about how your mom was going to be upset? I still gave him extra food. So what that tells me is that this has been a careful, manipulated, manipulated story from Mr. Ferguson from the very beginning of this thing that he's going to put the blame on his mom. I'm going to be manipulated. I have Asperger's syndrome. I have autism. I have Stockholm syndrome. You mentioned him saying, well, maybe I have Stockholm syndrome. This is an individual. But the truth of this is, the truth of this is, is that we have two individuals, two individuals that lack empathy, who 
with emotion in both of them. The triggering factor in this report, the triggering factor that caused this abuse was the removal of the husband, of the stepdad. Once he was gone, these two individuals were free to torture somebody, and they did it. That's what they did. And I think Ms. Vanderark did use Mr. Ferguson. I think that she, she knew from his history that he was predisposed to torment Timothy. I think that she knew that he would have no problem doing that. Mr. Ferguson walked through that door and was happy to be the enforcer. He was happy to do it and continued to torture his brother over and over and over and over until he was a shell of a person, until he was dead died from starvation, died from hypothermia, he had no, no fat on him, barely any muscle on him. And the whole time, just letting it happen, letting it happen. The report says, it appears that the stepfather's presence in the home had prevented Paul and his mother from abusing the victim. Again, it wasn't anything to do. They were just holding him back, essentially. The overall opinion, which I think is important, is, in my opinion, although the defendant's participation in the abuse was, a, was in a part a function of his social milieu and living situation, these contextual factors were not a necessary condition as previously noted, mental health records contain information to the effect that while they were still living with their father and stepmother, and reportedly had no contact with their mother, Mr. Ferguson's stepmother told the psychiatrist that he had become bossy, and had something to do, and the defendant himself that he had become irritable. Due to his younger siblings not listening, he gets physically aggressive, he's told his younger siblings. He also reports that he's gotten irritated with his siblings and has pushed them into retaliation. He's also tried to lock his younger brother seated in the closet because his brothers wouldn't listen to him. Consistent with this, North Shore's police department documents indicate that Mr. Ferguson's stepsister told police, quote, he is the biggest bully she's ever in his, her life, and he found genuine joy in tormenting Timothy in the hospital when they were living in the biological father's home. Notably, the defendant allegedly engaged in this abusive behavior despite there being any safety rules in place, despite his father and stepmother disapproving of this behavior to such an extent that they removed him from their home once he turned 18 because of it. In my opinion, Paul Ferguson was predisposed to abuse his brother independent of his mother's present and active influence in his life. Nonetheless, in my opinion, Mr. Ferguson's involvement in repeated acts of abuse that amounted to physical and psychological torture over a period of months reflects a general lack of empathy for his brother and concludes that, in my opinion, there is no reason to believe that Mr. Ferguson's conduct disorder has remitted or that his participation in the abuse of his brother was not an expression of a persistent antisocial behavior. The court is concerned uh, that Mr. Ferguson will not get the help he needs in prison. Uh, I think he's one step away from becoming a psychopath like his mother. And uh, the court is concerned that he represents a danger to the public. Uh, that if released, he, he would represent a significant danger to the public. The, 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 the charge here is child abuse. And um, I don't think this charge or the sentencing guidelines take into adequate consideration of the long sustained torture in this case. As I indicated in Ms. Vanderark's testimony, there was a long, long period of months uh, of, of various punishments, including uh, bread with hot sauce. There's hot sauce that apparently contains two of the hottest peppers that we have in, in the world. Uh, wall sits for an individual who practically had no muscle on him, running up and down stairs, cleaning out a garage with no pants on, and sleep deprivation in itself. Putting alarms on him so he couldn't move or sleep. Making him puke up food. There's bathroom time. 
sleeping in the closet with a tarp down, which quite frankly might be considered animal animal abuse. We have a human being uh, making his hands over his head. And then at the end of his life, an eight hour practically ice bath that killed him. So no, I don't think any of those things are, are taken are adequately taken into consideration by the guidelines. And I don't think the guidelines, quite frankly, can even these guidelines don't justify Mr. Ferguson's actions. Mr. Ferguson, I, I think you are a product of your environment. But I don't believe you that you're sorry. I don't. I don't think you have empathy. I don't think you have any emotion whatsoever. And that's what scares the court. It really scares me. Uh, I think you're sorry that you're here. I think you're sorry you got caught. I don't think you wanted Tim to die either like your mother because you would get caught and you wouldn't torture me anymore. And uh, believe me, I, I have tried to sit here and try to think, well, maybe Mr. Ferguson's not as bad as mom. I think you're just as bad, if not worse. If not worse. Because you, you had a job. You, you could have, Mr. F Johnson actually asked you, couldn't you have brought home a, 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 a thing of food for him? You could have gone to a neighbor and said, hey, my mom's abusing him. You could have you could have grabbed him and got him out. You could have done any number of things to stop this. And you chose not to. Your own brother. And uh, this is where we're at. So based on all that, it's a sentence of the court. You served 30 years to 100 years, Michigan Department of Corrections for 592 days you've already served. Court's going to assess a $68 state cost, going to take a assessment, no additional costs. Mr. Ferguson, you have a right to file an appeal in this case. If you need to retain an attorney, you need to be appointed to your company's expense. Request for the assistance of the lawyer must be made in 42 days from today's date. Clerk is handing you a form that you must complete, return the court in that. In two days, if you wish to request the appointment of an attorney, appeal is adjourned. Well, there you have it, folks. 30 to 100 years. Let's just take a listen in and see if there's any interviews after this. I want to see if Mr. Robertson has something to say. Most of them are jail judge. He's going on to the next uh, case. But those two two uh, psych reports were critical, critical. And the judge did his due diligence. I got to give him credit. Read, read through all of those text messages, thousands of text messages. Those reports really took it home yeah. and and sealed his fate. I'm just going to continue to monitor uh, the the feed. It's now you know they're now off, but I want to just see if there's any interviews. I've been saying all along, and I took a lot of heat, Ed, um, I, that Paul Ferguson is a danger to society. I proposed to our audience on several different occasions, would you want Paul Ferguson living next to you if he got out in a year or five years or 10 years? And my answer to that was hands down, no. Uh, for, the, for the reasons of all that was stated in court today. But Ed, you and I, you know, just like everybody else that's out here, we do our research. I looked into... Paul Ferguson and Shonda Vander Ark very strongly. I wanted to see about their history. I wanted to read about their And based on the history combined with the actions that we saw, it was enough for me to say, you know what? I don't want them to have a chance to hurt an elderly person, a young person, a middle-aged person, a human being. 
And if Paul Ferguson walking the streets in society, I don't care how much therapy he gets, there's still that capacity within him to do what he did to poor Timothy, the handcuffs, the, the, um, you know, the hot sauce, the wall sits, the chasing him around the house, the taking the food and pulling it away from him, all of the things that he did in the totality of the whole situation. I think 30 to 100 years is appropriate. Which yeah, the, his, the history of um, his behavior with his biological fa father and um, the Oklahoma evaluations and all that, the, the things that like that, we didn't have that. I didn't have that. And um, and it was critical too, because it showed a pattern that, hey, this is just be, this is well beyond being manipulated by the mom. Okay. Right. This is something he was predisposed to, right? He had these traits before, you know, going to live with mom. And then mom took advantage of those traits, okay, that he had to be his her enforcer. Yeah, and, and 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 that was compelling that we heard the judge talk about some of these things. And he said that he received numerous letters and numerous um, correspondence from just people who were watching. And one of those correspondence came from me. And the correspondent that he got from me was straight to the point. Look at the hot sauce taste test uh, video. And I actually condensed that video into a short three minute or four minute period so he didn't have to watch the whole thing it was uh 15 minutes in, in in entirety i actually condensed it to the judge from when they ingested that hot sauce two grown men to uh, the end when they were breathing and gasping for air and saying it was like fire inside their mouth their teeth felt like they were hot they said it felt like the feeling of impending doom imagine poor timothy ferguson having to ingest four of those pieces of hot sauce laced bread on his very last day with that frail weight and condition that he was in paul ferguson gave him that on july 5th of 2022 timothy died july 6 2022 this sentence is just the sentence was fair the sentence is what was needed in my opinion let us know in the chat. Yeah, I agree. I agree. After after finding all these terrible things about him um, in those two reports. Uh, so, yeah, yeah, yeah 100 hundred percent. And Dr. Schaefer, Dr. Schaefer said he is, if anything, borderline psychotic, but he does not suffer from intellectual disabilities. That was mm -hmm. I wrote that down. It was one thing that I wrote down. The rest of it, I just committed to memory. Um, but I thought that that was important and the judge made sure that he was evaluated and that he was not only looked at by one but two doctors and we we heard in the paul ferguson jailhouse calls that he was getting 25 minute sessions uh, a few at a time with these doctors and he actually joked about it he said to his uh, step grandma uh, and we heard these calls um and they're publicly available i have them i just never posted them because i wanted it I wanted to wait till the sentence. I will post those calls after this now. Um, but Paul Ferguson was joking and 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 kind of laughing it up with, I can't wait to get out of here. I can't wait to get out to the outside. Well, guess what? That's not happening. And did you see the look on his face, Ed? Oh, my when God, yes. Said when his 30, head popped up? When he said 30, 30 to 100 years. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Yeah. I'm going to go back to that now and play that um, play yeah, that back you, so you guys can yeah. see it. But you know me. You know me. I follow the evidence. Wherever the evidence is taking me, that's where I'm going to go. And the evidence now is clear that we didn't have that. And do you know who else didn't have it? The district attorney didn't have that evidence about him before he kind of came up with that deal. He the, Paul should have been evaluated before the mother's trial, not after the mother's trial. That I mean, uh, you know, so that. The, the district attorney could have had that that information before he started, you know, into a deal with uh, Paul for his testimony. Um, but thank God it, it worked out and he, the just uh, justice was served here with the proper sentencing. All right. Just by a show of hands in the chat, who wants to see Paul Ferguson's head pop up 
when he is when he hears in the courtroom 30 to 100 years from the judge. Put a one in the chat if you want to hear it again. Put a two if you'd rather not, and you could just watch the replay. So I'll go based on what the 3,900 people here want to see. Uh, if you want to see his head pop up and that look on his face, he was almost like a deer in headlights, right? Did you see his eyes, how his eyes bulged out? Um, mm. All right, so looks like everybody wants to see it. Ed, let's let's see if I can let's see if I can work my magic here. Um, the audio is horrible on this man. These guidelines don't justify Mr. Ferguson's actions. Mr. Ferguson, I, I think you are a product of your environment, but I don't believe you that you're sorry. Worse. Or you served thirty years to hundred. Or you served thirty years to hundred years in the shoe department. Wow, it there it is. just snapped right up. Oh my god, like the whiplash. Yeah, I'm gonna do it what? again. He was like, he's like, what? 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 Your own brother. And uh this is where we're at. So head down. Head down for all that sentence of the court. You served 30 years to hundred years and shoot and uh or you served 30 years to 100 years, or you served 30 years to 100 years in the Chicago Department of Corrections. Credit for 500. Look at him breathing. Look at his chest. 30 years to 100 years. Look at his chest. Credit for 592 days you've already served. Or yeah, he's, he's it looks like he wants to vomit. Yeah. Whew. Well, listen, it, as far as I'm concerned, in, in the profession that we're in, we've seen evil. Ed, you've seen it over 2,800 times with these crime scenes that you processed over your time as an NYPD professional detective, first grade. Um, these are folks that do not deserve to be walking amongst us. This is evil. And for someone to do what Timothy uh, Ferguson was had to endure from Paul and Shonda, so for somebody to do what they did to Timothy Ferguson, that constitutes evil, my friends. That constitutes something that doesn't need to be walking amongst us. These are not human beings. These are monsters. Um, so Shonda will be in her area. The, I see that some people in the chat are already asking, will they be able to see each other? No. no. Completely different facilities. She's going to be in that Huron. Uh, she's there now woman's facility which is a, a a nightmare of a place it's got bugs it's got um uh, all kinds of mold growing in it leaking water backing up toilets bugs crawling all over her and, and at night paul is going to be in a, a separate different facility uh and they won't get to see each other this is going to be his life 30 to 100 years and now that 30 years don't get caught up on it that doesn't mean in 30 years that he gets out it's just that at 30 years, he can start applying for parole. But 30 to 100 years, he's 20 years old now. That is his life. That is the life expectancy. Remember Shonda on the child abuse charges, Ed? She got 50 to 100 years. Well, he gave him 30 to 100 years uh, for the child abuse first degree. He was not charged with murder in the first degree, which he should have been. But he, that was the deal he worked out with the prosecution uh, for testifying that they would not charge him with murder. Had he been charged with that murder, he would have also received life plus 30 to 100 years on top of that. Now, in Michigan, in Michigan, is, is there um, a psych defense? But he insanity, can't. He, insanity defense? I, I, don't think, I, I don't think there is, right? I, I remember somewhere, folks, if you know. Uh, is there is there the ability in Michigan to uh, use an, an insanity defense? All right, let's go to the chat. Hashtag duty Ron, hashtag Ed. Ask us your questions, and we will try to answer them uh, as best as we can. I'm not sure. I'll look into that, and I'll ask yeah. some of our legal experts. Um, but, you know, it should be available on um, online. Right. We should be yeah. able to look that up. But, uh, his, you know, when he testified, though, you know, this is this is again. He he was manipulative too with his testimony. He came off um, sympathetic, right? Okay, he came off, uh, you know, like he, um, you know, that you would want to possibly give him the benefit of the doubt that you know it was the mother, it was the mother, it was the mother, um, right? 
Right. And, you know, and given her right. the appearance and the way she acted, you, you could kind of buy that, right? But well, look at look at this. Not statement. seeing that report, though, not seeing his history, right? Not right. knowing that. Look at so this. He, yeah, this is evil. This is. Thank evil. you. Thank you for this statement. Yeah, absolutely. I'm sorry, but this doesn't give justice to Timothy. Revenge is not justice. This is not revenge, in my opinion. And and I'm not. I'm in no way, shape, or form trying to dog this comment. I respect it, but the legal process is is what it is. And this is not revenge. This is. When you get a, when you get arrested and then charged with a crime, you get tried before a court of law. Paul Ferguson didn't even want to fight these charges because he knew that he couldn't fight them. So he pled guilty to the charge of child abuse in a first degree, in a plea deal for him to testify against his mother truthfully about what happened. But in the process of him testifying truthfully to what happened, he also implicated himself in what he did to his brother, which was a tag team of starvation, torture, inflicting pain and torture, and um, resulting in the death of a 15-year-old brother who was his own flesh and blood. That's his brother. That's his I'd biological like, I, brother. I'd like to um, understand Rachel's comment more. Rachel, please elaborate. Where, where is where is it? Put it back up. To, um, it's gone. Uh, oh, I, where she, is she called it revenge? Yeah, where is the revenge? Who, who you know revenge? We, who's getting the revenge? A family member? Society? I mean, where where is the revenge? Yeah, yeah. Hey, listen. We can all agree to disagree. You can never really change somebody's mind, and I'm not looking to change anybody's mind. But we have a justice system in place. If you commit a crime and you're found guilty by a jury of your peers, or if you gu you're guilty by your own admission, then you pay the price. And this is the bottom line here. He tortured, tag teamed. They tag teamed Timothy Ferguson for six months. The hot sauce, the handcuffs, the ice baths. How do you put somebody in an ice bath that is skin and bones and they did it on july 5th they did it that he did it for hours remember folks he testified that timothy stayed in that bathtub from 12 noon on july 5th until late into the morning he said he came home from work at 2 a.m and timothy was still in that bath and what did he do he went to sleep come on come on now amazing Amazing that mm -hmm. that could even exist. Uh, but because Adam, the stepfather, took a stroke, and we don't know why, how or why he took that stroke, why that happened to him, um, and that's up in the air for question, question, but he's dead now. But once he was removed from that house and he couldn't uh, stay within that house because of the stairs, he went to, he went to stay with his own mother. But that's when the torture commenced. That's when all of this started. If he was there, none of this would have happened because he wouldn't have allowed it. He was a normal person. So I submit to you, the bottom line here is, is once that opportunity presented itself to those two, they started this program of systematic torture. And it was a tag team WWE match. Shonda Vanderock. Paul Ferguson. There's nothing more to say. Uh, and I'm just going to try to look for a feed. I'm going to go full screen with you. I want to look for uh, comments. Just check the chat for any comments. Hashtag duty Ron, hashtag Ed. Here's one that I just saw. Where is it? Um, shit, the comments are moving so fast. There was one for, for both of us, but it just went by real fast. All right, I'm scanning the the I'm scanning for um, any type of interviews. Anybody has any of those interviews, just send it to me. Um, send it to me by email, dutyron4503 at gmail.com. All right, let's see what we got. Ed, you see anything in the comments? Yeah, you know, I still think the father, uh, the biological father, has some uh, culpability here and um, should be held accountable for. Eric, you're talking about Eric, right? The biological father. Yeah, Eric. Yeah. The, the stepdad was Adam. 
Now, the stepdad, I, could, I can't understand this. Okay, he has a stroke. Now, strokes are caused by blood clots. Okay, so what, I mean, what wife, what wife would, would give up her husband and send the husband to um, the, their, his parents, his adult, her adult husband to the parents to take care of the husband that that should be the wife's responsibility is it is it me am i wrong with this no no I mean, no that, i mean that just goes to show you further about her okay that she would allow that to happen and apparently he was the dam keeping them back right holding the holding the psychotic family back from torturing um people and once he was out of the picture oh man the dam broke very sad. Very sad. Uh, I'm scanning the various networks. I just want to continue to uh, look while you uh, grab some of this stuff. Um, Prosecutor Matt Robinson, uh, Roberts, I want to see if he makes any type of um, statement. You know, he made a couple of statements on court TV right after this, but I don't see court TV covering it uh, unless I'm missing something somewhere. Um, but yeah. Look, this sentence is something that I said to myself, um, 25 to life is something that I would have been comfortable with, and he got 30 to life uh, for child abuse. Again, he's not charged with the murder of his brother, so he got off easy, got off easy. If you're not yet subscribed here to Crime Time with Duty Ron and Ed Wallace, please consider subscribing. It's free. Just go over down into the little button there, Give the thumb, video the thumbs up and subscribe. Uh, you, As you guys know, we do a lot of these live streams where we cover the sentencing of some of the cases that we've covered in the past. So if we cover a case and Ed and I break down the crime scene, we break down the evidence, and those perpetrators come into the court system, and sometimes it takes years, sometimes it takes months, sometimes you know it takes in between. But when we do get those sentencings, we try our best. And, and I ran to work early this morning to bring you this coverage. Ed, you know, I know he's got things going on. He's, he's going to be traveling shortly. Um, he'll be on the road. But we, we wanted to bring this to you. We thought it was really important. And your feedback is very important to us. You know, um, I hear all sides of this thing. And I want to go to the poll right now real quick. So 3,441 votes came in. We asked, what do you think is a fair sentence for Paul Ferguson? This is before uh, Judge Kasel, uh, it, you know, came down with his sentencing. What do you think is a fair sentence for Paul Ferguson? He is guilty of child abuse by his own admission, uh, child abuse in the first degree. 3,452 votes came in, 25 to life, 53%, 10 years. 24%, less than 10 years, 14%, and no jail time or and just therapy, 8%. Those were the choices. 25 to life, 10 years, less than 10 years, no jail time, and just therapy. So those were the numbers. They came in 3,000 now, 469 votes. It's still tallying up. The votes now are not fair because I guess everybody knows that unless you don't know that he was sentenced to 30 to 100 years. But, Ed, what do you think of that? 25 to life, 54%. 10 years, 24%. Less than 10 years, 14% of our audience. And no jail time, 8%. Your thoughts on that, Ed? Well, I think our audience got it right. They were spot on. You know, yeah. You, you know, so 30 to life, 25 to life, not much difference there, five years. But I think they, they saw it. They saw it and realized that, uh, this is what he should get. And the judge concurred, basically. I want to make another point. The judge had the authority to sentence to two years minimum. And any number, it says it in the, I have it saved. He could have sentenced Paul Ferguson to two years in jail minimum. And then any other amount, he could have said 10 years. He could have said five years. He could have said anything, but he was convinced that Paul Ferguson did this intentionally and knowingly. And he wasn't buying the uh, excuse of Paul pointing the finger to his mom. He said that loud and clear, Ed. I mean, Judge Casel, although the court audio sucked 
you know, and that was un again, you know, again, that was out of our control, but the court audio sucked. But when we enhance it, like I'm going to have Kristen run it through audacity or some audio enhancing program, and we'll try to get that audio real well. And uh, we will upload the sentence for you. Just we'll cut it. We'll cut out all the fluff and we'll just give you the sentence. And then Ed and I will give you some. But see, the, the, the reports, the, the reports were critical. The reports were critical and it showed that Paul enjoyed this. Yeah. He yeah. enjoyed this. That's just sick. That's the crazy part is that he, I mean, look, you can't go and do something like this for six months and not get something from it. You cannot just tell me that for six months he was just like, all right, look, I saw the, we all read the text messages. They were read in court. There was over 2,000 pages of text messaging. We only heard what they wanted to present to us in court, but there's so much more to the text messaging. There's so much normalcy back and forth with them communicating daily. When Paul would go to Applebee's and do his dishwashing thing, the mom would tell him, when you come home, make sure you check on him, make sure you give him this, make sure you do this. And, and he could have just went right to sleep. Everything was on video, and she was recording everything. And this was a a tag team, um, it, it was a tag team collaboration between the two of them. Uh, and they got off on torture and pole. And now people are asking about sexual assault charges. He was not charged with any sexual assault charges in the state of Michigan. The state of Oklahoma is where those alleged sexual assault um, allegations are coming from. But that is so far in the past they have not charged him with anything, and I do not foresee them charging him with anything because he's in jail for the rest of his life. You know what? Oh. Go ahead. I, I just looked up the Michigan law. There is an insanity defense, and thank God he didn't go to trial and he pled because with this report that they gave, he could have got off totally if he took it to trial and pled, and pled um, not guilty by reason of insanity. Right. But he didn't. But he didn't. Yes. Um, let's look at some of these super chats. I want to go through them one by one because there's a lot of them here. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Mary Ann, for being a um, gift in a member member uh, membership. That's always appreciated. Karen D, thank you for becoming a new member. Linda, thank you for being a YouTube member and becoming part of the family. Um, who else? Lisa, Ed, I got to take this call. I got to take this call. I'm going to mute myself. This is my doctor. I got to take it. Okay, please. All right. So justice uh, was served, in my opinion. And, um, you know, uh, I wish we would have known more about that history of Paul and those reports uh, prior to the trial of his mother. Um, I don't think he can appeal um, because... Uh, he accepted this agreement um, with the council. Um, you know, but I'm now in hindsight, uh, knowing that he could have went to trial and pled not guilty by reason of insanity, he with those two reports, he probably would have got off if that went to a jury. So I think the state of Michigan is quite lucky um, that he took the plea uh, to testify, and and a just sentence was in fact uh, delivered. Um, yes, I did a, think the judge really did his homework. I mean, he he left no stone unturned, dotted his i, crossed his t, use what any analogy you want. He read through all of those text messages. That was telling to me because you know. The, Again, when you're prosecuting a case, the defense, the prosecutor is going to put out the most damning stuff, okay? And so he wanted to see everything, and he did. And he read through it, as he said, thousands of texts twice uh, and so forth. Um, and he had those reports, and he ran through them. Hold on a second. What's this? What's this? Well... Siva says uh, he wouldn't have got off with insanity in Michigan. I don't know if those were two court 
two court appointed psychologists or psychiatrists that looked at Paul and came up with that report, I think the case uh, for insanity was made by those reports. Uh, there's, you know, I think uh, a reasonable, now again, he could have chose a judge and not a jury trial. And right. I think a judge looking at that, yeah. Yeah. looking at those two reports is, yeah, this, this, you know, Paul is not right. Well, I scanned. You okay. All, I, yeah, I'm good. No, no, no. I got an appointment for uh, that thing that I was talking to you about. So I got a the thing with that guy that you did thing, that favor for. The thing over the thing with the guy with the thing. Yeah, no. So it was it was my doctor. So I, I had to take that call. All right. So um, I scanned all the internet. I'm sure that there'll be interviews forthcoming. We will find them and upload those for you. Um, but I have to do this. We're going to end in a little bit, but I have to do this. I, I got to play this again because the reaction of Paul Ferguson when the judge, Matthew Casel, says 30 to 100 years, he had his head down for a good three to five minutes. Ed, I, I'm not exaggerating. Well, he had it, he had it down longer than that. He had it down yeah. for most of what was going on. Let's take a listen. This is Judge Matthew Casel just moments ago sentencing Paul Ferguson to – 30 to 100 years uh, for child abuse in the first degree. Muskegon County Court, State of Michigan, let's take a listen and let's watch Paul's head pop up. Nonetheless, in my opinion, Mr. Ferguson's involvement in repeated acts of abuse that amounted to physical and psychological torture over a period of months reflects a general lack of empathy for his brother and Concludes that, in my opinion, there is no reason to believe that Mr. Ferguson's conduct disorder has remitted or that his participation in the abuse of his brother was not an expression of persistent antisocial conduct. The court is concerned uh, that Mr. Ferguson will not get the help he needs in prison. Uh, I think he's one step away from becoming a psychopath like his mother. And uh, he didn't like that. He presents a danger. Represent a significant danger to the public. The, 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 the charge here is child abuse. And um, I don't think this charge or the sentencing guidelines take into adequate consideration of the long sustained torture in this case. As I indicated in Ms. Vanderhoek's testimony, there was a long, long period of months uh, of, of various punishments, including uh, bread with hot sauce. There's hot sauce that apparently contains two of the hottest peppers that we have in, in the world. Uh, wall sits for an individual who practically had no muscle left, running up and down stairs, cleaning out a garage with no pants on, sleep deprivation in itself, uh, putting alarms on him so he couldn't move or sleep making him puke up food. There's bathroom times, sleeping in the closet with a tarp down, which quite frankly might be considered animal, animal abuse. We have a human being uh, making his hands over his head. And then at the end of his life, an eight hour practically ice bath that killed him. So no, I don't think any of those things are, are taken into consideration. An eight-hour ice bath. Consideration by the guidelines. And I don't think the guidelines, quite frankly, meet them. These guidelines don't justify Mr. Ferguson's action. Mr. Ferguson, I, I think you are a product of your environment. But I don't believe you that you're sorry. I don't. I don't think you have empathy. I don't think you have any emotion whatsoever. And that's what scares the court. It really scares me. Uh, I think you're sorry that you're here. I think you're sorry you got caught. <laughs> I don't think you wanted Tim to die either, like your mother, because you would get caught and you wouldn't torture me anymore. And uh, believe me, I, I have tried to sit here and try to think, well, maybe Mr. Ferguson's not as bad as mom. I think you're just as bad. If not worse, if not worse, because you, you had a job. You could have, Mr. F 
Johnson actually asked you, couldn't you have brought home a, a, a thing of food for him? You could have gone to a neighbor and said, hey, my mom's abusing him. You could have, you could have grabbed him and got him out. You could have done any number of things to stop this. And you chose not to. Your own brother. And uh, this is where we're at. So, based on all that, it's a sentence of the court. You served 30 years to 100 years, Michigan Department of Corrections. Credit for 592 days you've already served. You see that deep swallow? Oh, oh yeah. This this would be a good one for Dr. G. Oh yeah. Credit for 592 days you've already served. Yeah. It almost looks like he threw up in his mouth. Dr. G is going to definitely do this. Ferguson, you have a right to file an appeal in this case. Retain your attorney and be appointed to your expense plus fees. Based on all that, it's a sentence of the court. You served 30 years to 100 years in the Department of Corrections. Credit for 592 days you've already served. The court's been assessed as $68 state costs. I thought for a second there he was going to reach for the garbage pail like his mother did. Uh, but anyway. Yeah, so, I don't think his would have been fake. <laughs> no, his wouldn't have been fake. It looked like he did throw up in his mouth and he swallowed it. All right, Liz, ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you for being here. This was the Wheels of Justice. Justice for Timothy Ferguson. Again, my thumbnail and the um, trailer shows pictures of Timothy Ferguson. That's what we want to remember. And as Judge Matthew Casel said, when Shonda was sentenced, she no longer can hide in darkness. And same goes for Paul Ferguson. We all know what you did to Timothy, and now he is paying the price for it. When you take someone else's life and you torture somebody and you abuse them and you get caught, you have to pay the price. And that's what he's doing. Judge made a good decision and a fair sentence in my opinion let us know in the comments down below and if you're not yet subscribed to crime time with duty ron and this guy ed wallace hey ed what am i doing over here and i'm supposed to be over here um <laughs> please consider subscribing ed um i know that you you know have i wanted to go to you for final words because you know we both been following this case so closely i know you and i might have differed at one point in the beginning of this. And like you said, you didn't have all the information, but uh, I just wanted to go to you for your thoughts, Ed. Yeah, yeah. Um, the revelations of the uh, the reports uh, were were tremendous in, in, and it was something that I was missing when um, not having that information. And, and you could see it too with the prosecutor when he said, I wish I would have had this before, okay? Um, he dealt with Paul, uh, and uh, when you see him on the stand, you know he looks sympathetic. He he looks uh, as a beaten person himself, but in reality, the history here tells, says it all. And I, you know, I was definitely off the mark. And you know, he now um, got the justice uh, that he deserves uh, for for his participation in. In fact, you know. Again, I think what would have happened if the if the prosecutor had that, he would have charged him with murder. There would there would have been no deal. Yeah. Right. And and I understand that um, you know, being a psychopath is not the same as being insane. All right. I, I understand that. Okay, you know, and so but it, you know, it would be an interesting trial nonetheless, had uh had he went to trial uh, and the, he was charged with the same charges his mother was charged with, uh, which now it seems like he should have been. Yeah. Yeah. Now, you know, he should have been. But look at this. Look at this comment, Ed. I feel like I'm a student of at Crime Time with Duty Ron and Ed Wallace University. I like that one. That's a good one. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. Uh, but we're free here. So, you know, you're getting a free education. <laughs> okay. um, you all right, folks. I got to run myself. Yeah, I got to run too. I just want to just a couple more of these super chats. Thank you for covering. Uh, this will Paul do time in a mental hospital or prison in prison. There's nothing in the sentencing that stated that he was mandated 
by the court to get any type of mental health counseling or anything. But hear me out. And inside the prison where he is going to have his forever home, he will be afforded all kinds of things uh, as far as psychological counseling, uh, mental health therapy, medications, and so forth. So he will be afforded that if he needs it, but it was not mandated by the court in the sentencing. I didn't hear anything about it, Ed. Correct me if I'm wrong, but yeah, all I yeah. heard was 30 to 100. No well, he said, was, I, hope, I hope he gets help inside of prison. He didn't say it's up mandated. To the prison staff. It's up to prison staff. As it's we also know. up to him. He can, he can refuse it. Correct, correct. But they will, you know, obviously he's been looked over, looked at, uh, pre -sent, you know, for pre-sentencing, uh, you know, evaluation and so forth. He'll have that uh, available to him if he needs it. Thank you, Wendy, for becoming a new member. Uh, and Heather, uh, Heather's journey, she says, great coverage on this case. Thank you for sharing your perspective. It was an accurate assessment. And again, let me know in the comments down below what you think. I have been taking shit for this since the beginning. People have been coming at me and I've been allowing it because it's as long as it's respectful, I don't, you know, I don't care. If you disagree with me, I'm not here to have you agree with what I say, but I shoot from the hip. I call it as I see it. And the bottom line is I saw this from the get-go, from watching the trial from looking at the paperwork and looking at the stuff, reading affidavits, reading former reports from Oklahoma, reading all of the evidence in its totality. And I said to myself, Paul is evil and he is a danger to society. When I said that, Ed, I took so much shit. So many people emailed me and sent me messages like, I'm unsubscribing. I don't like what you're saying. I think you don't know what you're talking about. You don't know nothing about this duty, Ron. And I was just like, hey, okay, whatever. But that is my uh, my thoughts, and I'm not changing it because you're mad at me. I'm, I'm sticking to what I believe, and I heard it today from the judge. He felt the same exact way I did. So, All right. All right, folks. On behalf of Crime Time with Duty, Ron, and Ed Wallace, everybody, be safe out there. Make sure you. See, I'm sending, and Ed and the entire community, we're sending strength, prayers, and positive vibes to the prosecutor, the judge, all of the defense team, all of the people who are involved in this thing, the prosecution, the defense, everybody had to go through it. The jury, the community, everybody's affected in Norton Shores. You know, think about these neighbors. Think about the people that live on that cul-de-sac where we saw that ambulance drive away. They're all going through it. So strength, prayers, and positive vibes to them. And Dr. Ed Moskowitz, may you continue to rest in peace, sending strength to Julie and his children, his adult children, and his extended family. We're sending you all of our best. Ed, I know you got something to say. Always, folks, thanks for being here. Thanks for sharing your time with us, your precious time. Um, spread the word about uh, Duty Ron. And uh, always be safe, be prepared, and watch your six. Thank you for joining. This has been the sentencing of Paul Ferguson. Peace and love from Crime Time with Duty Ron and Ed Wallace. Thank you, guys. Peace.